Good afternoon and welcome to the second part <coughs> of this day um, where we're going to have more panel format and, uh, and uh, new persons joining us. We have uh, on my very left uh, Octavi de la Varga, who is the executive director of Metropolis, the World Association of Metropolises. So we have uh, a global, the global city, big city network uh, present here. Um, and well, continuing towards me, Peter Stolten, whom we have already uh, seen before, who will also comment and react to, to our two speakers, to our two main speakers, and to my right, the second speaker, Dani de Torres, who uh, was a commissioner for immigration, the uh, Ayuntamiento in Barcelona, of the city hall in Barcelona. <coughs> So he developed the intercultural approach uh, of the city and today is working as a consultant for, for instance, for the Intercultural Cities Network for the Council of Europe uh, and many other uh, organizations and what, what on integration policies and what kind of nicely connects uh, both uh, speakers is that we can now move a little bit uh, with our analysis to the global level. No, we have mainly spoken about Europe uh, in, in the morning session and now we can see how this all, whether the, the same problems uh, also uh, happen at the, the global um, level or whether there are big differences because there is a different governance system obviously of migration. So I would not spend more time, uh, just explain you the rules of the game we have said to each of the two new speakers to present their work a little bit uh, in 20 minutes, more or less. Um, and then we will have maybe reactions from the panel, from Peter and from me, and then we will open it rapidly uh, to have a bit of more of an interactive debate uh, with you. This is also the opportunity to bring up all the questions you had still on Peter's presentation before, uh, for which we didn't really have time, so don't hesitate to bring them back in. So over to Tavi. Okay. So thank you very much and thank you for inviting me this afternoon. I, I won't give any specific example, I'm aware, but I will share with you the concerns and the debate that we are having right now in our board of directors and with our member cities in this context. I'll, and I give you the context of the cities, especially the, the main ones. Uh, well, I would say this Metropolis. Metropolis is the World Association of uh, major cities and metropolitan areas around the world. We have members in, in, have 138 members in all the continents, and it has two levels. One is more a political space for mayors to exchange strategies, priorities, approaches to their policy making, and then as well have the more the specific level on capacity building, learning, training, and exchanges between, between our members. And of course we have a context which is quite different from many years ago in terms of uh, cities and major cities. The, when Metropolis was constituted, that was in 1985, there were only 200, maximum 100 cities over 1 million inhabitants around the world. And that at what time, that was a lot. Now we have over 500 cities over 1 million inhabitants, and one city of 1 million inhabitants is nothing right now. We have in our membership, we have cities with 12 million, 9 million. If you count the people that go on an everyday basis on the commuters, you get cities with uh, 20 million inhabitants on an everyday basis. You have cities like in Seoul, where you have 40% of the population of Korea, of South Korea. In Buenos Aires or Lima, you have 30, 33% of the population of the country. Uh, Athens, the metropolitan area of Athens, is 33% of the population of Athens, and so on. So. So we have a, real, a reality right now that was not 20 years ago where most of the population is uh, living in major cities and that goes in a kind of strange circle where the bigger, the bigger it gets a city, the most attractive it becomes for people. And well, right now it's said that 54% of the population, of the world population is living in cities. For 2050, it's calculated or it's foreseen that at least 70% of the world population will be living in cities. And that's an unstoppable trend. And in fact, of all these people living in cities, 
40% of the people living in cities lives in major cities, in metropolitan areas. Uh, and especially while I run, well, I don't want to overwhelm you with figures, but it's important to take this into account where we are tackling issues about immigration and refugees. I'm almost calculated that around, because this is very difficult, because there are no registers, but around 800 million of people are living in slums around major cities. So there, there is an issue. And in parallel, what we are discovering in our debates, uh, when I'm going around with our members and visiting our members and talking to mayors, one thing is coming, well, you would think that I always, always want to talk about, well, my challenges in my cities, mobility, environmental, waste management, energy efficiency, and so on. But then it always comes something new that was, at, at least I haven't heard it before, from a mayor saying, well, one of my major challenges is managing diversity. And it's a diversity which I mean it's not only refer, and that's why it's over debate, it's not only refer about migration, but it's, and that's important to take into account when you deal with migration, is that societies, and especially in major cities, are more and more complex, are more diversified, and people and citizens are having more and more different interests. And there are different layers of approaching the right in your city. And the biggest your city is more heterogeneous, more difficult is to have homogeneous policies, but of course, at the same time, you cannot do tailor-made policies for each single citizen. But now you have to deal with the interests of elder people versus young people. The interests of women are different for interests of men. Uh, if you live in an area, it's different your interest than if you live in another area. And then, as well as as citizens, we have different layers of approaching and different interests. And sometimes conflicting interests. It's not the same me being an elder uh, man living in a certain area of, of Barcelona, like a young girl living in another area of Barcelona. Uh, so already we're facing societies which are complex and which need uh, different requirements and dif different demands. If you add the issue of migration, that makes more difficult that handling major cities. And as well, I think the trend that you look around is traditionally we, we tend to think that it's an issue of uh, uh, north, global north cities uh, receiving migrants and global south cities are the ones who are sending uh, population out of the cities. And that's no longer true. I mean, the reality of cities uh, everywhere around the world are sending people, but at the same time they're receiving people. <coughs> and as well, that changes a bit the parameters of uh, previous years. Um, and that you have, you can find cities that are the ones who are sending population. There are other cities who are, which are receiving population. And there are, there are, as well, there are cities which are kind of a stopover, like, an airport when you do the transfer, well, it's the same cities are, are uh, a moment for, stand, for stay there for a while whilst you are trying to, to move to another city. And that happens in Europe, if you look in, you know, in the trends of migration in Europe, like the Mediterranean city is kind of the first uh, approach to Europe, but then more, most of the migrants want to go to northern European cities. But it's having in Africa where people are going from some one city then, for example, to Johannesburg, or it's, having, it's happening as well in, in South America, in other, in other areas. That's one thing. The other thing as well is, it's more in some countries, it's more increasingly difficult to differentiate between migrants from other countries and migrants from the very country. And for example, in China, well, they have, cities are having lots of problems with migrants, but their migrants are all, they call migrants to Chinese people. But the reality from Chinese people coming from rural areas, arriving to metropolises and megapoles, that's really, really as, as shocking as Assyrian people or arriving to Europe. And that's a reality as well, because in Europe, sometimes we've been distinguishing between uh, people moving within the country to people coming from other countries. And in some realities of countries, that's no longer the, the reality. And as well, I think we are reaching as well situations like in China, where there are some cities, cities that you have two, three millions of migrants. And one of the challenges is, do you have uh, citizens, first-class citizens or second-class citizens, especially in major cities? Because it's not only major cities, only about integration. I mean, that's the debate that for many, many years, especially in Europe and North America, that's mainly in Europe, we were discussing about integrating migrants. But it's not only about an issue of diversity and culture. It's an issue related, especially in, in poor countries and in, in countries where there are major social gaps. There are, has an impact as well in informal economy, uh, as it has an issue in housing. Uh, most of the times in African cities, in Chinese cities, when migrants arrive, they move into the informal economy because they need to survive. 
they move, they need housing, and issues in Africa, it's related to slums. So it's not, the issue is not only about cultural integration, it's about how do you handle it, that suddenly a city grows without control and the conflict. And, and that forces cities and leaders in cities to think from a wider perspective, like more integrated approaches. And in fact, that deals as well with, you know, we have a new context, which is, uh, you know, the, the Agenda 2030 with the SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Objectives, and as well you have the new urban agenda. The new urban agenda, for the first time, and as well the SDGs, acknowledges cities as an actors. Because for a while, uh, that was the feeling as well, is that migration policies was an issue of state policy. Cities were the ones who only had to implement social policies, nothing else, no? because they had, to, they had that people and they had to do social policies to integrate them more related to education, communities, and so on, intercultural dialogue. Uh, but then, of course, cities, I said, well, we are receiving most of the people, we're receiving you. It was, I think, the most clear example is what happened with the refugees crisis in the Mediterranean, when suddenly cities said, okay, we are, we are welcoming people, but then we have to accept, we, we want to say something uh, in relation to European policies and to national state policies, even if we don't have the powers, but it's affecting our society, it's affecting our reality, beyond, of course, solidarity issues and right issues. And that links as well with the new urban agenda, because the new urban agenda is talking about the right to the city. And what does it mean, the right to the city? It's about human rights, but as well as how citizens can, can live in a city, can have a proper life in the city, and that you don't have second class or first class citizens. And there's an issue as well, I said, integrated approaches, because I said it's not only about culture, it's not only about integration, but it's about uh, informal economy, it's about housing, it's as well about the use of public space. With migrants, I mean, have, sometimes have different approaches to public space. Is there issues about, about feelings about security or no security in the public space and everywhere? And of course, it's about acknowledging this, this reality. So far, as a global network, for example, as in, I know in Europe there's been a lot of experiences, but as a global network, there's been not exchanges between cities in terms of learning from each other what they are doing. What doing. That's a challenge that now we have on the table in our, in our network. So it's more about this debate that we are having, how to approach these, these conflictual things. Uh, but then we are setting up what we, have what we call the policy transfer platform, where we want, it's a place where we want to compare policies between our members, and one of the issues will be migration and uh, how, how our cities are accommodating to, to migration and how they're <coughs> developing new policies to that. For example, and uh, related to the right to the city, which is not only something conceptual, in China there are some cities like Guangzhou. In fact, if you are a migrant and if you are not allowed to move to a city, you are not entitled to any service, you are not acknowledged as a citizen, but you are living in the city. So you need a special permission to move to the city, and you need then you are acknowledged. But the city of Guangzhou, what they are doing is, no matter if you are migrant or not migrant, if you are coming from rural or rural, you have the same rights and you have the same access to different public services as citizens of your city. Because when in Guangzhou you have like two, three million of migrants, that has an impact in your reality. So not acknowledging that you have three million people living in your city doesn't sort out the problem. So the better is you, you have to acknowledge this reality and then develop proper, proper, proper policies. And I think the issue right now is about, at least for our cities, is about resources. So you need, to, you need resources to implement appropriate policies and as well as about legal frameworks, because what you can do at the end of the day as a city is if you don't have powers related to, to migration, and the only these powers and competencies are only related to integration and social issues, it's very limited and very, very reductionist. So, because if we're talking about integrated approaches, then I think that the trend is more and more, and we're coming from last week, there was the Mahelen conference on on migration and refugees, and our position uh, local governments was to have more powers and to have more uh, right to a say in all the international agendas and as well national agendas when you are developing uh, migration policies. Well, that's more a kind of very quick overview on, on our debates, and I think then we, I can go more in, in depth. It's very, thanks a lot for this very interesting presentation. Little change of plan. If you have some concrete questions on, uh, uh, to Octavia and what he just said, things you didn't understand, maybe it's, a, it's good to address them now before you forget them. 
No? Everything clear? Metropolis is from ONU? No, we are independent organization. It's formed by city, only by cities. So in the case of... But you have a relationship? Yeah. Sorry? You have a relationship? Well, we have, for example, right now we are renewing our agreement with UN Habitat. We are part with, of the Global Task Force. The Global Task Force is a sort of network of networks of local governments' networks that are, yes, a bit like complex, but it's the ones who are kind of having the dialogue with the United Nations. And in fact, what we are saying, and links with this debate, that so far all the urban issues have been constricted to the new human agenda and the Habitat 3 process and Quito conference, and now well, we have the Agenda 2030 with the SDG 11, and now what we are doing with the United Nations is lobbying the United Nations, saying all the policies and all the agencies that are tackling different issues, no matter environment, gender issues, poverty, everything has an impact on cities, especially in this context that I was telling you that we are becoming a more and more urban, urban world. In fact, Europe is already urban, it's 80% of the population is living in cities, Latin American as well. So what we're trying to do is, with this global, which is called the Global Task Force, which is, as I said, the network of networks of cities and networks of cities, we are trying to have a dialogue, kind of uh, urban mainstreaming, urban issues within the United Nations. Mm -hmm. But of course, nation states are against that. And for it's our membership, which are paying fees. So in the case here, it's uh, Barcelona and the Metropolitan Area of Barcelona members. Madrid is well as members. So we have cities from Johannesburg to Berlin, Montreal, Buenos Aires, Bogota. So and based in Barcelona. We are based. The Secretariat is based. We are based. <coughs> the team we are based in Barcelona. Okay. Another question on Metropolis so far. Okay, then let's move over. We can, we will pl have plenty of time to discuss um, in the second round. Let's move over to Daniel Torres, who, well, can surely connect yeah. very well to what we yeah, just said. Yeah, I think it's <coughs> very complementary. And I, I, when you talk, Octavia, about resources and legal competences, I, I'm going to focus on 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 the other. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's not that just. I remember when I was. Commission of Barcelona, I went to Geneva, they asked me to do a training on, on how to support them on defining the intercultural strategy. And I remember explaining them the participative process, how creativity was totally fundamental for the approach here, how to be, build this platform of, uh, of civil society actors and, and people from cultural, social, sports, and even some private universities. And they, and they said, listen, God, I'm sorry, but we have too many budget here to do this. <laughs> it was like, what? what do you mean? You know, I mean, I mean, we, we don't have this creativity and this, you know, we, 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 we just, just put some money there, you know, like then we, and we, when we do a service, you know, like, and, and, and that was a comment, an, an eternal comment of a director. It, it wasn't a self-criticism, but it was about like, um, um, yeah, maybe you are in the innovation because, you know, you need to. <laughs> you need to innovate, you know, otherwise you, but I think in terms of in innovation, and, and I think Octavi's presentation is perfect to, to uh, in terms of the global, uh, in terms of innovation, I think there are different issues that we need to take into account. When, when we see the last 20 years, the evolution has been in the last 20 years on, on the approach on the managing diversity goal, okay? I think as Octavi has said, um, um, First thing, cities have become an important players, and, and that's fundamental players. In, in Barcelona, when I started as a commissioner in 2007, we tried for first time to, to say, okay, the previous models of, of managing diversity, um, or the current models in that time uh, existing that we could identify in the world, um, they were really state models, national level models. Um, and we realized that some of the main challenges that and, and, and weaknesses somehow that those models show. Um, it was about a lot of human relations, okay? I mean, how to promote positive interaction among people. It wasn't just about welcome policies or, or supporting migrants to whatever. It was more about the cohesion, the sense of belonging, a lot of the subjective elements of, of, of being part of how to avoid segregation, ghettization, how to build a common identity. And, 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 and that was not just about how to deal in terms of you know, specific policies. That was 
that requires a wider approach. And that approach that it was mainly also based on how to promote positive interaction in, in, in the cities. It, it was the cities where this <laughs> experience take place, when you experience diversity in your daily life. So at the end, depending on, as, as Octavi said, depending on where do you live, how do you connect, where do you go, and, 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 and what is the quality of public space, what kind of public transport you use or not, or private transport, and um, what is the, 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 the citizenship recognition that you have, um, but what's your relation with the neighborhood and, 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 and the daily life? How many people do you interact in a daily basis? That's fundamental in terms of how do you feel if you feel part of a society or you don't feel. Um, um, if you just relate with certain group of people, you have a more diverse uh, uh, relationship with, with many different people. So, in, in, and I just explain a brief story of my evolution from the Barcelona experience to the more global. And, and in Barcelona, we, we tried for, to, to, to define this, this inter, intercultural strategy, taking into account the, the lessons learned from, from the weaknesses of, of, of some uh, previous uh, models of managing diversity. So the first thing we realized is that in order to, I don't know, to convince the mayor and um, civil society actors and other political parties and other executives and officials from different departments, we should explain, uh, you know, in, in a good way, what, what was the goal, what was intercultural. I mean, so, and I'm sorry because there, there is a student from my master class here, so <laughs> she will repeat something. And, 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 but I'm going to be brief, okay? okay. <laughs> but it's about, I, I always make this test with some uh, officials in cities and say, if you, if you have 10 minutes with the mayor right now, close you in, a, in, a, in, a, in an office with the mayor, how would you try to convince her or him in, in, in terms of? what is managing diversity in the city important, why it's relevant, why is, is it important nowadays. You know, what arguments you would use on how would you explain the intercultural approach, you know. So we, we identified this, the three principles that could be very useful in, in a very short time to explain uh, what were the main, you know, guidelines to, to, to for all the policies <laughs> at, at the city level. So that, those three principles, the first ones was about, we need to assure equality of rights, duties, and, 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 and in a wider way, and social opportunities, which is quite complex, of course. But that was trying to avoid the superficialization of, of, of the approach. You know, people thinking that interculturality is about making some foods, fusion foods, and gastronomic festivals in the squares, you know? I mean, this is not about that. I mean, this may be important at some point, but this is much more profound and, 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 and deeper. So, uh, the increase of complexity, as Tavi was saying, and, and diversity in a wider sense, not just migrants arriving now, but how are they all diversities? Uh, uh, what, what tensions put this, this reality into the, the general goal of equality of rights and, and, and duties and opportunities? And, and, and that's a very important question that we need to make ourselves when we are in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, dealing with, with, with the cities and from government, also from civil society. The second principle uh, was about like the recognition of diversity in a positive way and saying, okay, diversity may be an asset. Maybe it's not just something we need to deal with, um, 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 but it, it, it may be seen as something, you know, as an advantage, as something uh, positive without that kind of, you know, too happy, you know, kind of cosmopolitan diversity discourse of, oh, diversity is great just because of that and that's cool. No, I mean, it poses complexities but also opportunities. And depending on how you deal with it, 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 you will reinforce complexities or you will reinforce opportunities. But you need a, a discourse that, that, that is solid and it's not just very naive or very superficial, but it's complex because if you don't lead the discourse, you need political commitment here, others will, will fill the gap. And, and, and that is when you will be reactive to that. You know? So I think innovation also in terms of managing diversity is being, is being proactive on leading the social and political discourse, you know. I, I, I remember when I started in Barcelona, and like many other cities I've been there, it's like, listen, uh, we do a lot of things here on this, but we don't tell, we, we don't explain that much, you know, because otherwise people may think that we are doing a lot of work for migrants, you know. And this is not very, you know, like, and that was a very, okay, you know, I understand this approach because I know the service in the city, I know how people feel in the city, you know, at that moment, if you check the service in, in Barcelona, people 
already in that time, now thinking about that is curious, but at that time a lot of citizens thought that the governments they were working more for tourists and for migrants than for citizens. Okay, That's, that, that, that was some feeling. This is not original from Barcelona at all, you know, I've, I've we seen. But you can have a different strategies here, saying, okay, I'm going to work on integration and welcome policies and a lot, but I'm not going to say anything. So not just be shown as too migrants friendly and going, you know. Or you can say, no, come on, we need to talk about this. We need to have an open debate, you know, a social debate, and, 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 and including everybody and listening a lot, a lot of people that they don't feel that they are being listened. You know, what are the worries, what are the concerns, what are the interests, what are the needs of many people that in this globalization process and this increase of complexity they feel more, you know, not very comfortable, you know, with, with the stability of many, you know, institutions are just move away. And, and it's normal that people show some discomfort about, about, about these new realities. So, this recognition of diversity, but in a, in a, in a, in a, in a complex, in, in, a, in, a, in a solid way, having a discourse was very important. And the third one, it was, I think, for me, the crucial one. Uh, it was the one that says, we need to promote positive interaction, okay? It's not enough to work for equality. It's not enough to put diversity as a, as a, as a you know, positive uh, issue on the society. If we don't work to see how can we promote positive interaction in terms of avoiding those tendencies to people to, to, to be this way, you know, to be segregated from each other. And whatever the reasons are, economic reasons are, you know, do you have a housing policy of doing a social housing, all the social housing in, in two neighborhoods, for sure you're going to have segregation in the future. So many cities know that, and some of them still, they do the same. You know, still they put all the social housing in some uh, neighborhoods. If you put, you're deciding to build uh, or, or, or to give the opportunity to some minorities, communities, maybe in your country are Muslim communities to build a mosque, and if you pretend to build this mosque in the extra radio, you know, really far from the city, or a refugee center, you know, like in Utrecht, I'm advising the Utrecht city on, on innovation in, in refugees integration. And, and it's so funny because they, they decide to put a center, a refugee center in, 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 in the city, in a neighborhood. And uh, mixing youth uh, from the local neighbors, uh, living together with the refugees and, and sharing some trainings for entrepreneurship, for English language, etc. Et so linking the center in a more open way with the neighborhood and providing um, 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 tools and, 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 and resources for the all population so they can see that the, the, the shelter not as a threat you know to the uh, reality and well-being and identity but but some also dy dynamic and opportunity that can dynamize the neighborhood well anyway in terms of the interaction what what comes was the idea that the cities were the place to really focus on on how this conceptual and theoretical idea could be put into practice so that's where we start uh, analyzing how people interact in the cities and how all the policies, I'm, I'm not just talking about Barcelona, about the Intercultural Cities Program of the Council of Europe with more than 100 uh, cities, and not just from European countries, you know, even Mexico, even Montreal, or uh, uh, Hamamatsu in, in Japan, or, uh, or in Australia, uh, uh, other cities are part, you know, non-European cities of this <coughs> Intercultural Cities Network working on, on how to move uh, further on this intercultural approach. Um, I, I think one of the innovations, a part of the political commitment and leadership, is the, the idea that um, all the policies have an impact on, on how people, you know, on, on the equality, uh, on the level of equality of the city, and on the level of interaction among citizens in the city. So if you have a urban planning that doesn't take into account these principles and saying yes, I'm, I, I'm responsible also. Depending on how I do, we design the city physically. We will have, a, you know, a, a, an environment in which people will feel very much easier to interact, or in which people will have very, you know, difficulties to, to interact among each other. I've been in many cities that you go to the neighborhood uh, in which is really nothing there. You know, no shops, no centers, no libraries, no nothing. And, and, and in central European cities, and 
And they tell you, okay, well, what kind of intercultural activities we can do here? And you, you can identify they are thinking about this idea of mixing people in the, in the street and making gastronomic festivals and whatever. And you say, listen, I mean, in this neighborhood, it's very difficult that people really interact. So, so the, the first thing you should in, try to, to analyze is, is why, you know, how can you, what can you change to make this neighborhood more lively in terms of people having more possibility? And maybe you need to, to change some laws in terms of how can you uh, put some uh, services in this city and, 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 and what political commitment do you have to provide this neighborhood with some services that on their own they will provide more positive interaction among people. But if, if, you, if you don't think about this and you just think on the interculturality thing of mixing people, you're not getting into the point. So if the urban planning department is not on board on any managing diversity strategy, you will fail on, on, the, on the deeper you know, uh, changes that you need to, to provide. But the same with the cultural policies, with the sports policies, with the participation processes, with the local security policies, with human resources policy. So, so it's about how all to have this integrated idea that managing diversity, it cannot be dealt only by one single department dealing with diversity. Not at all. Uh, you know, this is not going to change. But in this case, I want to put one example of, of how when, when we identify the main barriers for, for citizens to have a more higher and more intense positive interaction with people from diverse backgrounds, um, we ask more than 3,000 people in the city, from people from schools, people from, from, from very different profiles and backgrounds. And, and in terms of what are the main barriers for, for having a more positive interaction between people from different backgrounds, um, the most relevant answer was the subjective elements, the stereotypes, the prejudices, the ignorance, much more than not even speaking the same language or, or just being segregated in the physical. So that was the, the origin of the anti-rumors strategy of the city that, that since then, when I left the municipality in 2011, wow, that's intense debate. I wouldn't finish like that. <laughs> so, and, and, and I'm just have two minutes or something? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm done. No, no, no. Yeah. Go on for five minutes. Okay. If you want. Yeah. I give you five. <laughs> no, just to just to show you a little bit how sometimes innovation comes from from a specific topic that they it can then you know increase the, the, the influence and, 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 and contagious different different areas and, and topics. So when we put this idea that prejudices and, and stereotypes were, were really relevant when you deal with managing diversity because they play a very crucial role on the othering process we were talking before, you know, like who is to do the us and them uh, barriers, you know, like, um, so there's a risk here of saying, oh no, all of this is about social and economical issues. Yeah, that's very important, but we cannot forget that it's not only about that. I mean, that's very important, but there are identity issues, there are differences that also, you know, uh, make stereotypes and prejudices and, and obviously power relationship and who decides who are the others and who you know and, and, and where this prejudice comes from who are the messengers of these prejudices so so we analyze this and, and we decide to, to launch this long-term anti-rumors strategy that was back in 2010 there were no post-truth period yet no fake news yet so uh, we're a bit happy to, to you know to being quite pioneer on, on dealing with this and, and and i think the proof is that nowadays there are a lot of people very interested because there is some also superficial approach to the for example the post-truth and the sh and the populist and xenophobic discourses you know like, like like if going against the fake news is just about spreading objective data that dismantled this, you know, and, and we know this is not at all, not just enough, sometimes even it backfires, you know. Um, 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 so we, we, we developed this specific strategy that was part of the intercultural strategy of the city, but those, it was one of the 80 actions of the plan, but somehow the, the, the daughter ate the, 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 the mother, you know, and it's a lot of people knew more about the anti-rumors than the intercultural strategy, because it was more exciting, it was more, you know, people got very curious about the anti-rumors thing, you know, even the media, citizens, a lot of cities and countries, so, so we start working on how 
can we deal with the street ups and prejudices in a long-term way? So in terms of innovation, I just want to point out a few key bullet points that I think they are common, not just for these strategies, but for many others. You know, the first one, I'd say it is about, okay, if you want to launch an anti-rumor strategy in your city, you need political commitment and you need to build political consensus. In this managing diversity issues, as much as stronger political consensus you get, the, the better for many reasons. And the second is like, you cannot do this alone. This is not just a governmental responsibility or, or, or even one department. Um, and you need an overall, you know, a general and transversal approach from the whole uh, administration, but also you need the engagement of a lot of people in the city, a lot of actors working together on this. So I think the innovation on how to build social multi-level platforms that collaborate and, and with the same goals, but are flexible enough to take the best of each you know, and not making this very institutional participation process where a lot of people feel like, okay, I'm not going to go to a workshop of three hours or four hours from seven to ten at night, you know. Um, but that usually only attract what we could call the usual suspects, okay, those who are professionals of participation. But then you leave out many other actors of the cities that they can be very important players on, on, on contributing to these kind of strategies, but we usually don't know how to, to reach them and how to track them. And I'm talking now about even people from private sector, people from, I don't know, you know. I'm, I'm, I, when we do the anti-rumors strategy in cities in, in Ireland or in, 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 in make a workshop in Japan, in Tokyo, that was really amazing, but also in Mexico, adapting the things with the indigenous people, with, 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 with many diversity issues in, in many places. But when you ask people, what are the allies that you have in your city that can be good allies on working on a long-term strategy to promote critical thinking, to promote awareness on, on diversity issues, um, you know, and, and sometimes people feel like, I don't know, I remember in Limerick always, you know, it's that moment in, in which creativity is absolutely needed. You know? And you say 6 p.m. In, uh, on the evening and you say, where is everybody, you know, where is people, you know, not many people in the street. They say, well, they are in the pubs, you know, they're in the pubs. I mean, okay, but um, it's not just single man, the idea of single man drinking beer in a pub. No, it's more family thing, you know, it's more civic center. A lot of people in the pub. Okay, so why instead of trying to get, take people out of the pubs, why don't we involve the pubs on our strategy? Why don't we ask plural pubs owners if they want to be part of, the, of, 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 of this process? And, and the funny thing is that you find how many people they, they want to, but they don't know how to sometimes. They don't know the tools, they don't have the channel, they, don't, they think it's very complicated. But when you provide them with some practical tools and, and some motivation and engaging in saying, hey, you, you are very important and you can contribute to make this city more you know, engaged, more open, more over. So you feel that and you start suddenly working with hospitals, you know, with companies, with um, uh, cultural centers, with museums, with a lot of, lot of actors. And I think knowing how to engage all these actors that are crucial sometimes of how do we live in a city, to invite them in the debate, to, to co-create with them some of the strategies and the decisions, and how to keep this engaging and motivation tension in, 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 in a process. Um, listening a lot of people, a lot of different voices. I think it's, it's, it's one of the most important challenges in terms of the innovation of diversity policies. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think there are a lot of things to discuss now for Peter. Um, let me just <laughs> want to react. <laughs> just two points from my side before handing over to him. What I found quite striking, connecting a little bit the debates of this morning with, with the, what we heard now, is that all speakers spoke about complexity, that super diversity, you know, um, and that the idea of targeted policies uh, are not, not feasible. We heard uh, about integrated approaches from Octavi as a solution that you need to connect different policy areas. Peter spoke about mainstreaming and Danny also you know, spoke about the necessity of cross-departmental work. You need to get on board also urban planning and so on. And you need to connect people, bring people together. No, it's not like 
uh, us and them, but you, you create networks, uh, flat hierarchies, where you, where you try to address this problem. <coughs> so that's actually not very controversial because you all, uh, you've all said the same. What I find, what I still try to, the second thing that I'm still struggling with is that you both brought, uh, you, all the three of you um, spoke about, well, no, Peter and Octavi spoke about different types of cities that we have, no? Pathway cities and stopover cities, then we have cities that are more receiving immigrants, others that are more sending, maybe at least regions. Mm -hmm. Peter made a point very strongly this morning, which was, um, we, we, we need different city model, uh, policy models no? for different uh, cities. For instance, uh, an intercultural approach might not work in, for every city, especially if the city is not super diverse but more polarized with a few strong minority groups. At the same time, we see that at the political level there are attempts no? to, to say we, the cities, no? and, and to kind of exchange intercultural cities is based on more or less one model that is flexible, but that is applied globally, no? And I guess in the learning platform uh, of Metropolis, this is also based on the idea that the cities can help each other. Now, the question would be, maybe it's only a few cities, it's not, of course, not all cities get involved in this kind of international activities. Maybe it's the most committed cities, for sure, no? That want to exchange on immigration, some others are not that present in these activities, maybe it's just uh, one particular type of city, mainly the super diverse cities that have these this biggest issues with managing diversity. I don't know, just to ask you if you can to reconcile a little bit this maybe contradiction you know, of, uh, on the one hand, like different needs, different types of cities, and on the other hand, at least attempts to kind of team up among cities, no, to, to find common ground. But of course you're also open to <laughs> to bring up all the other thoughts that you that you that you surely have um, from these interventions we just heard. Yeah. Yeah so I, I really enjoyed both uh, talks and uh, I think uh, Juan has done an excellent job also in putting these uh, speakers uh, together because the, the link between um, uh, what I did this morning and uh, um, uh, your talk this afternoon is very, uh, very strong. And it's very interesting. And uh, yeah. Dirk already uh, mentioned um, uh, some of them, so I won't reiterate that. But I'm struck by this similarity in, um, in the call for this transversal or integrated approach, and um, everyone on this side of the table saying we don't want or we don't need uh, these specific uh, uh, policies anymore. Uh, the, um, perhaps not even as a normative statement, but more as a statement of um, it's not fitting in uh, today's cities. It's not matching the reality of migration-related diversity that we are facing in, uh, in most cities. I think it applies to the, the, the really big cities that are in your network. Uh, increasingly, it also applies to, uh, let's say, the more mid-range uh, mm -hmm. cities uh, between 500,000 and a million that also tend to become immigration uh, cities. So uh, what I also liked is um, uh, that you brought in the more the globalization focus uh, this morning. It was also, um, uh, because of my own research uh, background, uh, very Euro-focused. And the interesting thing is, I'm listening to your talks, and uh, especially for Metropolis, of course, is that more or less the same things are uh, being experienced in cities in different parts of the globe. Huh? You mentioned that so many uh, cities are also becoming cities of immigration. I addressed that only very briefly this morning, so I was very happy that you brought that up again, because I don't think there are so many dissimilarities anymore between uh, Amsterdam and Johannesburg mm -hmm. in that uh, regard. Huh? Perhaps the type of migration and the timing of migration, <coughs> but both are becoming immigration cities and big ones and struggling with... Uh, what I also very much liked is this uh, statement that both of you made, that this diversity is just a, a fact in those cities. It's something that uh, I think you said you need to start with acknowledging it, and you said, well, this is just a reality, so it, it can be positive, it can be negative, it comes with pains, uh, but we need to start with acknowledging that it is there. 
And I think that is, that is, that is very important. Uh, this morning we talked about the complexity. There was another thing that yeah, you also addressed that indeed. Uh, the complexity it was reaffirmed, uh, was confirmed in all three talks. That we can't t talk about migration related diversity in simplifying ways, uh, not in terms of defining what it is, nor in defining how to approach it. Uh, there will always be um, uh, different circumstances. Uh, in local settings that require us to respond in some in somewhat different uh, way. Uh, you referred also to the pathway cities. Uh, uh, that's very different than cities that experience uh, significant settlement uh, migration. And you have the traditional immigrant cities like London that I use a lot as a case uh, study. And the much more recent uh, migration cities. Uh, they are experiencing it in different ways. And um, then also need different models. So that, that's a little bit indeed uh, where I, what I refer to in relation to interculturalism, because it's well, the most recently evolved policy model when it comes to migrant integration, and um, uh, also one of the most flexible uh, ones. It's becoming more, more, more popular and more um, uh, adaptive to local circumstances. But you know, I'm very curious to see, perhaps it's also a question, to, how, to what extent does this work in, in cities that are more divided, that have clear, distinct minorities, but then only a small number of them, or cities that are experiencing only temporary migration, like the pathway cities, to what extent does that fit in other cities as well? Um, what I liked um, uh, in, your, in your talk, Danny, was um, this, um, uh, um, well, that we should um, consider the discomfort that coincides with migration-related diversity as um, well, uh, not as normal, but they are there. They are effect of the uh, of what happens. And um, I, what I very much like in the interculturalist uh, approach um, is the orientation on these practical elements. So we have this long history in coping with migration-related diversity in a very symbolic way, uh, stressing these subjective cultural elements uh, with all sorts of inadvertent effects that sometimes you, you rather strengthen the identity of where people come from rather than strengthening uh, where they are now and where they are going towards together. And that's what I really like in interculturalism. It, it took a little bit the, 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 the contested core out of multiculturalism and assimilationism and then said, okay, let's, uh, with, a more, with a more neutral tone, let's try to promote contact in those cities in a very practical way. And um, what I'm very fond of are these really uh, down-to-earth, uh, down street-level uh, burger type of uh, uh, initiatives uh, like um, you refer to one um, um, and not putting social housing all in one neighborhood. I mean, this, um, if you think of it, the, it's, it's normal that you should not do that if you want to promote contact. And you don't need a PhD degree to understand that if you do that, it's quite problematic to promote contact. But I fully agree with you that if you, uh, I visit also many cities and I still see those errors being made. Also because of political reasons, eh? it's hard to sell yeah. to the more rich neighborhoods to say, okay, now we put social housing in your rich neighborhood. Eh? And, uh, the responsibility taking on that side uh, of society is sometimes problematic. But that's really what I like in interculturalism, eh? this pragmatic approach. Eh? So um, I think um, this morning we talked also about how complex and how almost impossible it is for city administrators to cope with migration-related diversity. In, um, in, in, in just problem solving, because you get contested from all sides. It's a complex mater material that you're working with, and it's heavily politicized. And then choosing this type of down-to-earth practical strategies can be very uh, convenient and very effective, uh, I, would, uh, I would say. Um, yes, positive tone. Um, that's, that's also an interculturalism, and trying to, to develop a more positive uh, tone. Um, there, I'm, for me, the, the jury is, is more out, yeah, as an, but I'm, as an academic. Because I think as a city, it's always dangerous to put myself in the shoes of city administrators, I do um, acknowledge what, what you say, that if you don't, as a city, if you don't take action to organize these interactions and also try to, with an anti-rumor uh, campaign or with a more positive tone, if you don't do that, if you, do not this, if you don't do this preemptive strategy, then you leave the space wide open for others to make it more negative. And that's, of course, what we see in, uh, in other cities. Eh? I'm thinking of 
Uh, my own city, Rotterdam, which is clearly a super diverse uh, city, uh, looks like London, not in size, but in terms <laughs> of composition of the city, but the response is so different. Eh? London is acknowledging diversity, is trying to manage it in a positive way. And in Rotterdam, nobody did that. It was this old, so we talked this morning about port mentality, port city mentality, so we don't talk about culture. Uh, we don't talk about ethnicity, culture, and that's all elitist stuff. We, in port cities, you don't do that. Uh, you just work, contribute to society, and if you do that, then you're in, and if you don't do that, then you're out. Uh, and um, that may be one of the reasons why cities like Naples, uh, uh, like Rotterdam, like Liverpool, are a little bit on the... the, the uh, those are also the cities that, that, that are, have left the space wide open for populists to come in, to claim the diversity uh, topic. Uh, mm. It does not explain cases like well, Barcelona, we talked about this morning, it's not, um, sees itself, uh, it doesn't see itself as a port city, of course. Uh, but Marseille, then, is a very different story. It is a poor city, quite like Rotterdam and Liverpool, but with a very different cultural story. So it would be very nice to, to compare those uh, cities. But uh, I think what is very important, well, just, uh, I want to leave the, the space for, for debate there, but what I really take from these talks, uh, combining it a little bit with my talk, is this complexity that it is acknowledged, because I like that it's done today, but if I go out into uh, the policy realm, then often I don't see this you know, complexity of noise. I think that's a key message for today, it is very complex. Uh, not a one-size-fits-all, there are very different types of, of cities requiring different responses, and we should really abandon the idea of specific policies, uh, that, that there are minorities and that you can treat them as minorities and have a specific approach that is in the contemporary reality of complex diversity, it's not possible. So we need this transversal approach. And then as a final statement to the, uh, I talked about gender mainstreaming this morning, uh, that I think we really should learn a lot conceptually, but perhaps also on a practical level on how gender issues were mainstreamed over the past 10 to 20 years, and try to achieve more or less the same thing in migration related diversity, mainstream it, make it an issue of everyone, of every minister, of every department, of any type of street level work, but in a super diverse uh, city. I think that's mm -hmm. an important uh, lesson. Great, thanks a lot. Um, we have just half time now, so a uh, good moment to say over to you uh, with your questions and reactions to what we've just heard from the three panelists. Yeah, I think that I'll also speak about uh, as briefly mentioned about this or why uh, a global level or even the European level the exchange of knowledge or practice between cities and um, that it was as a day to be because of the concrete rules of consensus that's so different or there is no effective policy tool to replicate or adapt uh, to the concrete uh, I, I think it's related with uh, what we said. I, I think so far um, we've been approaching all the immigration debate from a very Eurocentric northern approach and thinking that people just want to move to north. And with it more global context, and I was telling this urban context, I, the people and people that move there are thinking more where they have the opportunities, not in terms of the country, but in terms of cities. And especially because now people are not only going to European, European countries or North America, but they are moving within continents, within Latin America, within Africa. And that changed the approach. And that links with the issue of interculturality and diversity, because the European approach has been for a while, and I'm sure I'm simplifying, I'm, I'm not an expert, but more kind of the French approach. So it was a national state approach, like you become a citizen of the Republic, as long as you are a citizen of the Republic, everybody's happy, or the British approach is more, well, we live all together, but in fact we don't live together, each one lives in each, in each summer, but more or less we are there and we don't bother each other and we are happy all together. Uh, and the point, and that's very subjective approach, I mean, I don't have now specific data, but my feeling now, looking across my, the membership of Metropolis, is the point is when you overcome the national state approach and you think, and that's something you said before, is about when you think in terms of city, 
and the identity of your city, not the identity of what does it mean to be French, what does it mean to be British, or what does it mean to be South African, but in terms of your city, which is the project of your city, which is the identity of your city. That is easier to make people be part of a project. And my feeling is those cities who have a clear identity, who have a vision for the future, an idea of what do I want to become when I'm in 10 years' time, for them it's easier to integrate people. When you as a city don't have a project, you don't have a strategy, it's very difficult to fit everybody and your citizens there. But that's, so far it's very subjective, but I, I'm identifying some ideas, no? like in Montreal, in some cities that they have clear clarity on what they want to be. It's more easy than to discuss, because it's not about discussing if you're a foreigner or not a foreigner, it's about how we build this project of a city together. And that's, that's a shift. And it links as well with the issue of acknowledging, because maybe it's not a problem here in Europe, but in India, for example, and I won't say the city, but it was like the mayor saying, I don't have any problem with uh, migrants and people coming from other areas of India. And he said, because they, we don't have them. I said, but well, look at the street, they are working on the street, all this working on informal economy, people live in Islam. And the point was about him is what, they are not on the statistics, they are not mm. registered. Yeah. I don't have a problem with migrants. So that's a bit like, and so acknowledging this reality that you have people in your city. And the point is that you don't want to acknowledge because that has a consequences in terms of resources, in terms of changing policies, in terms that you, meet, you need to take action. Mm. While, and I was telling them before that once I was in Buenos Aires, and I don't know if there's anyone from Buenos Aires here, you have this chain of TV station of news which is very sensationalist. Yeah. And I was there at the hotel just watching the news and suddenly heard there's been a fire, I don't know which, in which area of Buenos Aires, three people has dead and two Bolivian people. <laughs> So it was like on two categories, people, people, proper people, and then Bolivian people. And then there's also sort of this issue about acknowledging in your city that there are people, real people, that makes you make shifts and makes you also change. So that's kind of, of the approach. And I think as well, the issue of integrated approaches, I mean, it's, it's key. But I, I will put an example which is not related to migration, but could be, it's about mobility. Mobility is not only about infrastructures. And for many, many times I've been thinking, Mobility is about going up and down, but mobility has an impact on economic development, has an impact on environment, has an impact on use of public space, has an impact on gender issues, and that for women feel secure because it depends on what you put a bus stop, or lightning, or whatever, has an input. So you need now, as been said, whatever policy at local level cannot be seen in isolation. It needs to be put cross-cut with, with other policies. I think that's the challenge for migration. There are some experiences, but to to, it's like to incorporate in any policy the view that you have migrants in your city, but then it's about the issue of acknowledging. If you don't acknowledge that you have 10,000 people, 100,000 people, or 1 million migrants in your city, then your policies won't change. So that's one of the challenges. Yeah, um, I think you asked a little bit why it's difficult to have a more collaboration between cities or, or yeah, something. Yeah, because I want to share like, also my experience because I've been in many networks and, and I think because now, for example, I'm, I'm the director of the Spanish network of intercultural cities, okay? And, I, and I, at this point, I would say the difference between cities, it's important because when you need to do something in one city, you need to take into account the specifics of, of that place, of the context, of the history, of the cultural world, so many things. However, um, in terms of collaborating and sharing, that's no big deal. I mean, it's very easy to find common things with very diverse cities, even in size. I mean, of course, if, if you have a 20 million and you have a 100,000, there are some issues that you don't even dare to talk about. But in terms of feeling part of the city, yes, you can share a lot of things. And, and I get a lot of ins inspiration when I was commissioner in Barcelona and then afterwards from cities that are really small and quite homogeneous. I mean, I would say, for example, in the Basque country. So when we start the anti-rumors here in Barcelona, some of Getxo, you know, in Bilbao, a really small city next to Bilbao, um, with a quite low level of migrants and diversity, um, but, but it was a decision at the end to be proactive on, 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 on having this topic on the agenda. No? And at the end it's like, um, it's like I w want to do this. And, and even if you have just a 5% of, of the <laughs> migration, the recent migration in your city, 
you can work you know even better to prepare yourself on changing mentalities and changing criteria when designing policies just to be prepared i remember in barcelona a lot of you know french uh, people came here to organize a forum on how urban planning and urbanism was and housing was really important for integration issues so the people from the urban planning department said oh no how these french come here to eat to pretend to teach us how to work on urbanism and diversity when when their results are not really to be really proud about <laughs> but what was the problem that the people from the urban planning department they didn't have this course they didn't know how what to say because they they, they still were not convinced that their work was really linked to the diversity issues so they asked me all the time to go to these places and say no listen I'm, 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 it's not me it is about urbanism urban planning and diversity Okay, for, for you, I'm a diversity guy. I'm going everywhere with this diversity. No, you have to go there. So what I'm offering you is that I can, I can help you and we can help each other to think how diversity has influenced in the urban planning. Because I said the, the, the urban planning policies that, that have been implemented in the city in the last 30 years, they've been, now we realize they've been positive in terms of welcoming diversity in the city because somehow the, the decision to, to promote diversification of, of, of profiles in, in the neighborhoods without investing in those neighborhoods where there were you know, uh, worse public space, investing in housing, in, 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 in promoting a lot of cultural and, and social activities there. Now that we have this new migration, that's a good thing because we are avoiding this segregation. But cities, um, at the end, can learn a lot and, and many cities they want to learn but they don't find sometimes the channels and, and the places to do that um, it's like promoting the cross-departmental collaboration who is the one learning and, and is a department it's someone from different department it's it's extra time that cities think then within the cities i i, I see i'm a director of the spanish network you know there's some tension this we, between those who travel and those who don't <laughs> in the cities, you know, that people consider this is not to work, you know, like, okay. Um, but somehow, when you find the, the right tools and places in which people who go there, they feel that the time spent there is worth for the work, that is, that is the only way, you know. So, I've been in some networks, I've been in some places in where you have these big events, then you have a lot of work, email working, you know, where people, it's, 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 a, it's a tough work, you know, you're in your department, you're in your origin things, you know, and then you got these emails, and then can you fill these indicators, and then it's like, oh, yes, 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 share your best practices, fill in these reports, and then, oh, yeah, you need to find extra job, you need to share, and then you don't read any other best practice, and maybe you have a lot of them, but you don't read them, because, because you have a lot of work, and, and so, depending on, on the personal touch, you know, but, Sometimes, and, and, and I think that's why all these organizations need to find the best ways to, to make this learning together and exciting things and being very practical and focus on specific tools or, or process and methods that have shown some best results, you know. So, for example, in, in, in our case, we are now uh, 19 cities in Spain, okay. We, we have a lot of demand of new cities to join. And it's a pity, but we say, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, you know, because if we move from 19 to 35 in two years, I don't have the capacity to keep providing those exciting and stimulating spaces of learning to each other. So we are thinking on how to deal with, with that. You know? and, and, and I think there are a lot of cities that really want to share and to learn from others, but they really need to find the, the, the best intermediates that support them on, on, on having, you know, and, and, and I think now there are more than this one, you know, and, and, and somehow what, what happens is that when it, there's a political decision to say, okay, we want to do the, our, I don't know, car sharing thing, or our bicing sharing thing, okay, just do a research, do a, you know, uh, let, let's, let's identify the five models that we, we identify, invest a little bit on this, and then we got it, you know. While some platforms are more like, I, I think that the Reddit, the Intercultural Cities Network in Spain, it, 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 
it fulfills different goals, you know. It, it's kind of therapy, you know, <laughs> where people that are very stressed every day working in this field like, oh my God, I'm not alone, you know, there are more people like me. Um, 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 yeah, we can share some of the things. It's exciting because it connects me into international level. Um, what it brings me, it brings you internal support, political support. So we use the networks to say, hey, this topic is relevant. So um, if the mayor, for example, they don't really are not very committed to this, but suddenly they feel that their city is part of the international whatever, and they, they are really happy to learn from their best practices, might say, hey, may, maybe this is important, you know, like, so it, it, it being part of the network, it's an indirect way to empower yourself within your city, which is a, also our goal, to empower this kind of, of, of policy. So there are different you know, like, uh, ways to do that, but I think there is a, a demand of cities to collaborate and to learn each other, but often it's not easy uh, to find the best. And I think as well, because for a while is because in Europe there's been quite a different network working on migration, refugees, but my feeling that it was more always focused on the social side and yeah. as well on the integration and sometimes it's and just simplifying but well it's integration it's nice and we need to integrate and diversity is nice. And then you have other cities from other parts of the world they think, well, I have so many problems. I cannot deal now with integration and diversity, it's really right. nice. But I, I have not have resources. I have other more urgent issues to do. But whilst now with these new approaches, this issue of complexity that we are debating, and you cannot escape this reality of migration. And now there is a more interest from cities to say, okay, even if I don't have the powers, I need to position myself. I need to go not beyond other things we're doing. I, I need to connect with other cities. On the one hand, to lobby the states and the national agenda, but as well to look at new ways of doing things. And for example, for us. It's the first time we, we've been existing for 31 years, 32 years, and that's the first time we do a position, joint positioning on migration. And that's because the current context forces us to do it and to demand clear frameworks, uh, clear legal frameworks, and as well all the burden that cities are undergoing no, on, on, on managing that. And so far it's true that many cities, I had the feeling many cities have been working more on a voluntarist approach and to certain, because there was certain leadership or certain mayor that wanted to do things, but and that's why I think beyond Europe, so, so far, there was not much interest to work on networks on working on that. They also have hardly any other option left. Huh? Yeah. In the traditional system, there were these nation states that were really uh, mm -hmm. guiding, uh, perhaps even directive in terms mm -hmm. of what you needed to do in terms of migrant mm -hmm. integration strategies. Well, that's no longer really either no longer there or mm -hmm. it's being decoupled. Mm -hmm. huh? that the, problems that cities see themselves faced with are not the ones that are being addressed at the national level. Mm -hmm. So then the only thing that you're left with is exchanging best practices and lessons between mm -hmm. cities. So I actually see this evolution of a broad range of different city networks. It looks like every year there are new networks coming up, popping up, and some, some are temporary yeah, for, for refugees, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, some are longer. But um, you mentioned that, that's very interesting. Uh, it's not only, uh, the function is not only horizontal. Huh? Mm -hmm. So not only this like, exchange of lessons, this promotion of policy learning, but I also increasingly see this, um, what I call multi-level governance mm -hmm. from below, uh, I described it this morning, but a more advocacy role. Huh? And so these cities mm -hmm. are joining forces and then taking their case together mm -hmm. to the European level or to mm -hmm. nation states and trying to make a stand mm -hmm. that uh, a different policy regime has to be adopted. With refugee integration at the moment, that's also clearly manifest. The cities do play a clear role. Also because the nations can't provide good solutions, uh, they're, they're left to the solutions that come up uh, from, uh, from below. But, uh, so I, I would say I'm a little bit more posi uh, uh, positive than you in terms of uh, cities collaborating. Uh, I see a lot of creativity there. I see a lot of uh, uh, cities who are eager to learn and then they look to the national level and then they don't get anything. And then they look at other cities in other countries mm. and then they do that. They, then they yeah. do find a lot of interesting material. And very productive. And we, and we just see sort of this, this process, which is quite new, no? And in Europe you have all this informal network of shelter cities mm. yeah. with Paris, Barcelona, Madrid and others. So United, in the United States, many mayors say, okay, we're not going to collaborate with Trump on mm. the issue and all these young migrant yeah. people. So you see that now cities are playing a new role, which goes beyond about the issue of integration, of course, which is very important, but goes beyond, it's more about influencing the policy and policy making related to migration. Mm. I would really like to pick up on the impact in terms of also changing what happens at higher levels 
uh, <coughs> of government uh, towards the end of the session because it's something we still need to talk about, I feel. But before that, more questions from you and statements. You said already in the morning that you had a lot of questions. Now they're coming. Yes. Yes, and no, I, I was thinking about that. This is like a They are like global problems, but local responses. There's like a nation versus cities. There's like innovation versus crisis in immigration. And uh, there is like a diversity issues in like a standard, a standard response. So like uh, we are here like uh, managing uh, contradictions. And, uh, uh, Mm. I, 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 I like have a question uh, for innovation um, because um, in Latin America we are speaking very much of innovation uh, and, and, I want, and I want to know about what, what is your definition or what, or what is your perspective of, of innovation? This question goes to Danny in particular. Yes. <laughs> well, I think it can go to all of us. Just because I said, I mentioned innovation. <laughs> I'm the innovation. Um, there are many... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's some two. Sometimes the most innovative is to identify what it's been already being done and it works and focus on that. Okay, I mean what I'm seeing in many places is that some of the I don't want to be you know to okay, I'm going to talk about innovation, but but the first thing is like many people have the mentality to start from zero many things, you know, and how innovation, we need to innovate, we need to change, whatever, no? and, and many times what I see in the cities is that there is this, this coordination and this lack of sharing, you know, and, and, and the strategies, and, and, and so when, I don't know, for example, you know, in Barcelona, I, I welcome policies of the city. Um, You had, I don't know, language courses, uh, orientation and training workshops for uh, advising on, on, on legal issues, uh, economic and labor, uh, you know, uh, uh, advice and, and how to in, in learn about the, the labor market and what, what, what your profile, and then specific workshops on some issues, etc. Et et But what, what happened? It, it's like, There were a lot of actors doing welcoming policies, you know, but nobody had the global frame, you know. It was like, okay, there's a municipality doing specific services. We have a very innovative, at that time, center, SIR, the service for, to attend immigration and, and refugees in the city, back from the eight, late 80s, you know. So it was because of, you know, uh, refugees from, from South American, Latin American countries at that time. Time, but then it was adapted to the current trends. But nobody, not many cities, had this public center in which anybody that arrived to the city can go there, and and you got like direct information about many issues. You know, it wasn't like an open window for everybody. That was a very innovative at some point. You know, because it, it, many cities just took that idea and just put it in practice. And maybe it was more innovative to have a more decentralized office in many neighborhoods and districts of the city, not just one, but a lot of them. But at some point, you, for example, we identify. And now, just let me share a very concrete example, okay? I think it's important because in terms of measuring the impact of policies, which I think it's a very innovative also approach, because it's innovative because not many people just use it, okay? So it's innovative because it's important to do an evaluation of the impact. Um, so, For example, in this city, when, when, when probably the most innovative project, okay, uh, uh, we, we realized that a lot of migrants, the arrival at, uh, in 2008, 2009, uh, 2010 mainly, become like family re, uh, grouping, okay, relatives. That was the main entrance after a very important arrival of, of, of migrants in a, in a regular situation, okay, that was 
for for a while, you know, the, the most important, not not irregular entry because people arrive as tourists, but then they stay as irregular. But at some point, it changed, and it was people with resident permit because they were regrouping family. So at some point, we we identify all these actors in the city that they were doing welcome policies, but it was this disconnected. So. As a municipality, we were providing grants to different NGOs to do the welcome city guide for the city. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, why are we paying twice? You know, why don't we work together, all of us, and do just one single welcome city guide to the city? You know, and the same was like, okay, we're, we're giving language lessons, and, and we as well, but we're full book, and oh, we, we have room, you know, and oh, why don't we share this? So at some point, we start you know, building this platform network, uh, collaborative, to, to share our know-how, our experiences, and then trying to be much more effective. That was very innovative, you know, in terms of just making more of what exists. But at some point, because of the existence of that platform, you listen to the, the, the needs, the worries of people, and suddenly some people say, listen, that we are in the field every day, and we realize some kids that arrive in May, June in the city, they don't go even to school, they, you know, wait until September and they spend three, four months not doing anything. So they moms and parents, mainly moms, they, they, they were said, listen, for us it's really shocking this, this, this ring counter after maybe five years, three years, two years of not living together. Um, they ref, reference people, adults, are they grandma or they aunt or whatever. Um, and, and, and these kids arrive in the city and, 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 and they, there was no offer for La Catalan uh, language or Spanish courses to these kids. Why? Because the schools, they were closed and, and, and the Catalan courses for the government, it was only for adults, so 18 over. So the kids from 11, 12, 13, they didn't have any offer to learn the language. So what is the innovation? You know, the innovation is the capacity of identifying the, the, the need and then to react. So, and how do you react in an innovative way? <laughs> the first one is the traditional way. It's like going to the education department or to the Catalan, you know, language part, say, hey, can you put some resources and, and to do something to this? And when they say, no, we don't have budget, we don't have that, then is the innovation, isn't it, okay? And then it's like, okay, so what can we do with these kids? Because a lot of these parents, they, they are telling us that they, they get depressed. They start school in September. Do you imagine the teacher in the class, 23 kids, and then two Pakistani and one China and two Filipinas, and, 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 and without knowing anything about the, the city, the language or whatever. But they spend four months already in the city doing nothing, just closing your house. So then you start deciding, okay, where they kids, what we can do with them, you know? And then say, okay, what are, which centers are open in summer? Okay, public libraries. Okay, public libraries, it's true, they are open. They do a lot of activities. Why don't we build some, you know, welcome course uh, or whatever for these kids? So we, we start working on this and the first pilot year was for 60 kids. And, and we compare the evolution of those 60 kids with others that they didn't go to the program. And that was the evaluation thing. So, so do you imagine the 60 kids in July and August being from 9 to 2 to public library with tutors and uh, learning not just the language but learning about the city, the culture, traditions, moving around, uh, learning about the services for youth or whatever. After two months they got the diploma from the mayor himself and uh, with all the families in the best noble room of the city council. And the mayor saying, oh, you're the future of the city, you know, diversity is our strength and, and, and thank you for coming here, we welcome you. And, and you see the parents and the mom, you know, like saying, wow, my kid, you know, just arrived here and, and, and they feel like, what? So we compared the results of those kids. That, that was a, maybe a, 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 a 40,000 euros policy, you know, that time. We compared the indicators after two years, one year and two years. Those kids who went, who went through the program, they have much less uh, problems in school. They have much more relations with other kids in the, in, the, in the city. They participate much more in other extra activities than the school. So, and they have much more positive interaction with many other uh, youngsters in the city. So, and that was a really cheap policy, 
you know? So then when you do the evaluation, you have the capacity to ask for more budget or whatever. But what I'm meaning is that in terms of innovation, sometimes it's not just the innovation is, is changing the, 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 the approach that you have, identifying what is being done, and of course identifying what are the barriers, you know, uh, that are uh, in, in, not, not making things possible. When you, when you see that the people from the sport department or cultural department, they are not really aware of what does it mean managing diversity from the cultural to the sports. I mean, the most innovative way is to provide some training, you know, <laughs> and, and, and to include some criteria on the design of some policies. That is very innovative. Um, but maybe it's very boring for people to be talking, oh, it's very innovative, we just include a few criteria in the, the rule of, for being a part of the head of this department, you know, or even in urban planning. And before designing a new neighborhood, you, on the, your diagnosis of the context, you should to include some indicators, you know, on, on the diversity, whatever. Well, this is not very exciting for many people, but it has a lot of effect on, on the impact. So. Innovation, it, it's, it, it takes a lot of faces, I would say, and, and sometimes we're really like, oh, innovate, so something really different, you know, and it's not that. I mean, so, in, from the wider perspective, what we were saying, yeah, we have to acknowledge that now we're in a very complex situation generally in terms of governance. I mean, everybody's rethinking governance at local, national, and global level. And in fact, the new urban agenda talks about this, and you said no, and that acknowledged for the first time in an international agenda talks about multi-level governance, so you have the vertical governance, which sounds very nice, but it's about collaborating different different levels, but horizontal governance as well, is how you work with the different actors of a territory. And that acts complexity. And in terms of, for example, the, with immigration as well, with all the immigration, which is not regularized immigration, decisions are taken by someone. For example, when the European Union agreed to have a share of refugees in different states, the refugees will be living in a city or in a place, and that will have an impact in the city, in terms of housing, where you are going to accommodate these migrants, in terms of social policies and so on. But as well, when a city is taking a decision on, for example, um, street, street selling, and then you have all these people selling fake products, uh, which are linked to mafias, if you take a decision as a city, that will have an impact in the, in the city next door. So you have more and more this wider approach, which is complex, yeah. And, and I think at that moment, nobody has a perfect solution on how to articulate all these different le levels and to take into account the interaction and the decisions more and more have an impact. To, uh, your own decisions have an impact on other people's decisions. I, I agree. It's, it's more the complexities than the contradictions. Yeah, you started absolutely. with contradictions. And yeah. I, I, I would not, not go along with that uh, frame. Uh, what we are seeing is not the global versus the local. No. Now it's in the local that we see this globalization process manifested. Eh? This term globalization, I'm not a big fan of it, but it happens to describe this precise phenomenon. It's not migrants versus natives, but it's actually a blend of where it's very hard to differentiate who is a migrant, who is a native. Eh? Mm. If you live in, uh, well, no, let's take it to my own city, Rotterdam, more than 50% first, second generation. Uh, migrant backgrounds. It's very hard to say who's a migrant and who's a native Rotterdam. It's very hard. So I would say those contradictions, they stem more from the previous period. And when you had clear majority, minority, you had clear minorities. Uh, I just come from Montreal. Uh, they're, they're, well, there it's also getting more complex, but there are still the discourse. Is a discourse that we um, um, that in, in Europe we, we we've also had for a very long time. A discourse on a society that is neatly ordered in cultural minorities, ne neatly structured in cultural minorities, and that's. Yeah, yeah, but it's the complexities yeah, that are connected complex. with innovation, yeah, because. Innovation, I, I will not redo this because I like this definition I, from policy literature, innovation is that you're faced with a the situation, there's no tailor-made solution ready that you can apply, that you can take from somewhere and then apply, so you need to come up with something yeah, yourself. Uh, and you do that um, in, a, in a deliberate effort to collect information on what would work and then you innovate. So innovation can also be trial, so change can also be trial and error. But that's no innovation. Eh? Innovation is really using uh, information, uh, being creative eh, is a word that is often not used. And that's what I like in a lot of examples that come from the interculturalism group. Eh? They are in a world that is not really marked by a lot of creativity, to be honest. Eh? 
dealing with migration and diversity, it's often much more, you have the big, uh, very symbolic uh, national discourses like the republicanism thing. And people, it's very hard for people to deviate from that. And that's also why for cities, uh, like French cities, uh, not by coincidence, it's very hard to innovate in response to refugee integration because they don't have the innovation mindset. Yeah, they think, okay, we, are, uh, we have this Republican model, we have new migrants coming in, they happen to be refugees, but that's not so important even there. So they have to fit into that model that we have. And of course, eh, when we are acknowledging this complexity all the time, um, what we see now does not fit in the structures that we have had so far. So that's why innovation comes up. And to, to, to wrap up and then go to uh, uh, the most promising, uh, now I'm going a little bit out of binds as academic, but the most promising examples in terms of innovation that I have seen are those ones that are really pragmatic. Yeah, um, uh, I have also seen a lot of failures, like um, in Amsterdam there were this iftar uh, breakfast. Uh, and though that was a total disaster uh, to be, uh, there's nobody from Amsterdam here. And I can do a little bit of Amsterdam bashing as Rotterdam, <laughs> so I was happy. With. But it was really a total disaster. Because what happened is you only attracted the people, the Muslims who are open for dialogues with others, mm -hmm. and you ex attracted the usual suspects that liked um, well, knowing more about Islam. And I was there actually, but the, the, the conversations were terrible. The conversations were constantly, oh, we, iftar has this meaning, and in Islam we do it like this. And then the others say, oh, in Christian uh, belief we also had something like, uh, like a fast period. So people were only talking about where they come from. They were not at all talking about what they had in common. Mm. So it was a total disaster. With good intentions, it was an utter disaster. So that's why I like these more pragmatic things, and just pragmatic trips, tricks, like making sure that a city does not put all the social housing in one neighborhood, or that you uh, put an, a mosque in, in, in a good visible space, that you uh, include diversity in education at a very early age, so at least they know each other, uh, know a little bit of, of different cultures coming to each city. That's, those pragmatic solutions are better, and also there is no one big solution like uh, the old assimilationist model, old multiculturalist model, those models uh, are gone, I would say. Thank you. Just to add a little bit uh, the European dimension of innovation, uh, very briefly, it is also a bit the fact that we speak a lot about innovation here and now uh, in social policies it's also a bit related to the economic crisis we, we are having now for a long time already. And it basically means doing more with less. Now you made this point very early on that it's often because you don't have the money that you innovate. And especially if you think about the European Union that doesn't have much of a say on social policies, no? the competences are with member states and other levels of government. At the time of the economic crisis there was this initiative, how can we get involved in that? Let's speak about social innovation. How can we help member states and cities and whoever to improve their social policies when they don't have any money because of the crisis? We can introduce this social innovation thing, which basically means take a, take a good look at how you do your policies. You, you made this point very clearly, have a rigid evaluation framework that's in itself not new because you have social experiments and so on, social policy experiments since the 60s, 70s in the US for instance, but it was a bit adopted, became a bit part of a European approach and that helped as always to promote this concept. I'm not saying that the Union uh, invented it, but it, it certainly promoted to think uh, about social policies with more innovation terms. Okay, more more questions and statements from you. My question is mostly for Danny, but also for the rest. Maybe you we could. this case from the Basque country, of the small town that uh, showed an open stance towards migrants and uh, ready to, to innovate in terms of policies. I wonder, uh, from your experience, yeah, not from theoretical perspectives, but from everyone's empirical experience, what are the driving forces that lead some cities and towns to show more open stance and uh, welcome 
also refugees but also migrants and what makes others not to do so? Is it on the one hand when we talk about cities we can talk about personalities yeah. like local administration or street level bureaucrats? We can talk about also the structure of factors. The structure of? Structure of factors like yeah. level of uh, immigration, yeah, yeah. or uh, yeah. unemployment or, uh, or uh, labor market in general conditions. And uh, yeah, between those two maybe primarily. Yeah. So from empirical, from your practical experience in the networks, etc. Yeah. What do you observe? We also go to I, I I would say <laughs> something not very like Okay, there are many different factors, okay? But one is the, the human touch, okay? <laughs> it's a person, you know? Sometimes there's someone who really, like, you know, I mean, that's not very, but it's very practical, okay? In terms of you asking why this small city, that's because the person that is there in charge, it, it has this, you know, that want to do it. I mean, and then it's really connect with the reality in the city, with a lot of factors that are really, and working on that, but that could be in other cities as well, you know. Like in that place, it's that suddenly someone, it's a driver that connects things, that it's, it's good convincing at political level, it's good building networks, it's good like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm making benefit of, of, of the offers existing, uh, on the, uh, you know, many of the cities that are part of, of the network are because some technicians on the, on, on the city level they have the, 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 the commitment, the need, the, the want to, you know, to say, okay, I want to come in, I want, I want to connect to someone, I have this, this. And then, of course, if you ask, for example, in Barcelona, okay, now, now, now it was my first comment, okay, so, so don't forget the human touch, okay, but it's not, of course, obviously, all that. Otherwise, it's a very poor uh, solution, you know, because if you depend on people, I, I think our goal is making these things not depending on, 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 on individuals, but how can you influence the structural uh, 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 and the context to make cities commitment and, and see it a more uh, you know, sustainable and long term. Uh, um, I would say, for example, um, in, in, in some, I would say the structural context influences, for example, in Poland uh, and Lublin, uh, before you were saying about this example in, in um, saying that in India that, uh, we don't have an issue because we don't have oh look at them no but they are not resistant so so totally the contrary you know like when you we do the anti rumors and we again it's not European in fact we did it in Montreal over there in Japan in Mexico just checking what are the main rumors regarding diversity issues in the city okay so we ask in different places the same questions so in Lublin Poland next to Ukraine. 1% uh, of migration, okay? Historically, much more diverse in the last 20, 30 years, much more homogeneous, cultural homogeneous society. The rumors are exactly the same, you know, exactly the same. Migrants take our jobs, and they are lazy, they don't want to work, and they live on social benefits, so, you know, it's like, it's a very, you know, contradiction, this is very contradiction. And, and, and then you have, like, okay, they don't want to integrate, they don't want to learn the language, and they, they, they lower the education levels, or whatever, blah, 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 they link to insecurity, uh, to delinquency, whatever. So then you go and say, come on, I mean, it's like, it's, it's, they take our jobs, they don't want, they, they, they abuse of the social benefits, and they're 1%. Well, who are these 1% people, you know? And it's like, no, well, actually 70% of this 1% are Ukrainian. Yeah, of course, they just on the frontier and they're getting in. Are they lazy? Are they, no, oh, no, they're really hard work people, you know, they're really cool, no problems at all. Yeah. So, so what is the 30% of the 1%, you know? And oh, some Chechenians, refugees, all that. And these people taking the jobs? No, they cannot work, actually, you know? Like, okay, so who the hell are, you know, like, well, there are then Roma women just begging in the square, you know, like, so how the paranoia in terms of the, 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 the perception, I'm, I'm, is this just Lublin? No, you cannot pretend that Lublin is isolated in a context on the Eastern Europe now uh, uh, in the global, you know, dimension. What does it mean? The mentality, the political discourses, the, the relation with diversity, historical relation with diversity, what the change of the political economic system has influenced the, 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 the relation with you know these societies with diversity and with accepting now or not refugees.
how the populist uh, discourses find more ground in some places than in others, you know, which there are a lot of complexities here. So even if Lublin, there's someone who wants to be more open, they, they're going to find a lot of complexities, you know, when trying to promote. But even then, I think why innovation is really based on cities as well. It's because you still have cities that are going against the flow and against the, 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 the you know, all, you know, and, and that's why they have this personality nowadays, saying, okay, I don't care about the national state or uh, even, I don't know, in, in Utrecht, and, and, I mean, uh, uh, this refugee center, it's against the state uh, uh, ways to use to do things, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, 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 and it provokes tensions with the national government. When you manage to deal with that tension and show the benefits of doing that, at the end, the state say, hey, before we were enemies, now I'm thinking that that makes a good solution for me, you know, so why don't we extend this model to other cities? That's the shift, okay? So um, I think there are a lot of factors that really makes uh, one city and, and others. But I think the civil society, the actors, uh, the, the, the level of uh, culture of participation in the city, uh, for example, there are a lot of cities that they have a really strong culture of being engaged in the public issues. There are other cities and societies that they don't have this. So if you manage to build a strong partnership with a lot of actors in the city, you are much more stronger. Uh, when we build intercultural strategies in, in Barcelona, you can, I, I've seen many cities that after a period of doing some strategy, there's a change of government and everything changes. If you manage to build a strong civil society partnership with many allies, universities, schools, uh, public libraries, uh, NGOs, um, and, and think tanks, and working together and, and, and feeling that they are part of the strategy because they, they've been an important part of, of, of that definition, then there is a change of government. And the new government, they found much difficult to change that because they met a lot of people say, hey, that's our strategy. It's not your strategy, it's not the city, it's our strategy. So if you want to change something, you know, and they say, wow, you know, that, that's, you know. And if you have international links and you participate in, in, in international networks, that there is some recognition also about your work. For the new government, it's also difficult to say, okay, I'm going to change something that Metropolis is putting as a best practice. Wow, maybe I think twice, you know. <laughs> so there are different ways to deal with trying to make more sustainable your, your, the, the commitment of a city. Maybe Octavia? Yeah, I think for me the key is it's political leadership and political will at the local level. And then you go to the person, but so is that there's one single person who if he has yeah. he or she has the will, which is the mayor, can make change happen or not. But the lead can try. Then of course you have you need to negotiate as you need to make uh, network with all your different actors in your society, but the trigger is political will. If there's not political will and to take risks and you are only counting votes, and how many votes I will have next year because I have an election, then of course not. But when there are changes, and those cities that are leading things like initiatives, it's because there's a political will, and there's someone taking the, taking the lead. Of course, that's, that's not enough. And then I think there's something that some changes, and it's linked maybe as well to this political will, is more, most of the times the debate on migration is about, as you said, how many how they use or abuse public services, how much money they get, if they get houses, if they don't get houses, if they get free uh, language courses, why I cannot get a language course for free in English or French, and they get in Spanish and Catalan. But when you do the other way around, it's focusing on how much social capital, how much talent it's in, there is in my city, then you change about their, their contribution. Imagine a city that's speaking 100 languages. That has a potential for your city, for the future, for businesses, for globalization, and so on. So if you look not only about if they use or not use, it's more about how they are contributing to your society in terms of businesses, in terms of making connections to other countries, other cities, and so on, then that changes a lot. Because at the end of the day, when we are all a bit kind of not fair, because when we talk about migration, we're always thinking about what they call, what call the, the bad migration, no? those ones who are seeking economic opportunities, and they are poor, and they're going to, but we also, many cities are competing around the world about attracting talent and being immigrants. But those ones, because they are highly skilled, they are good migrants, and we don't think they're migrants. But at the same time, they're also looking for economic opportunities. But so, as well, this, this debate. So, if you move more about what all this migration 
whatever, if it's a skill, not a skill, but can bring not only not right now, but for the future of my society, then you change as well the, the debate. Because not only about wasting money, it's about how we're building our city and how we make our city more prosperous. Thank you. I would say one last question from, from you. Um, um, I was thinking about what you just said about um, the low skills immigration and the political will that uh, member states have regarding the refugee crisis. And um, even though a city can be a model and contribute mm. to uh, local integration, sometimes the political will, um, I, I, I wouldn't say they don't address, but they actively um, don't want more uh, refugees, given this, this um, consideration. And maybe, for example, in Brexit, uh, the discourse is changing, attracting talent, and how maybe that could be more uh, a trap more than just uh, an effective discourse, you know? It's not, it's just having a different criteria, but to maintain exactly the same political will. And even though there are like good examples of Barcelona and London that are actually integrating, uh, this doesn't reflect in the whole city, in the whole city, in the whole country, and it's reflected on the political will. So how can we change that? Even though we're trying to change city by city and all the political will that's within those organizations and <coughs> in a local level, how can we put more pressure uh, to the political will to address the situation and not just give a discourse that might be consensus, but um, on the reality it doesn't change at all. Hmm. What I was referring about political will, I was referring to that at the local level. Yeah. And what you said, for example, the case of Scotland with the Brexit was clear. They made the studies, many cities in Scotland and Scotland, Scottish government, about the added value of having migrants. Because one of the debates of Brexit was how much was costing to England and UK yeah. the migrants. And the contrary, the, the cities in Scotland, Scotland said, no, no, migrants are contributing to the economy. So that's, yeah. mm. and it's true, you need to start up adding different cities, bringing together the debate. Yeah. So, that's, and that's exactly where I wanted to come with the, with the final uh, question to the panel that we already started to discuss a bit before. What is the impact of cities uh, teaming up? No? Can city networks actually change the discourse, for instance, in the UK? Uh, but also there are other impacts uh, in terms of do they actually change? Have they, uh, do we know of cases? where cities, by networking, by teaming up, actually manage to change the situation uh, at the global level, within the habitat process, for instance, mm -hmm. at the European level, on integration policies uh, or immigration policies. Uh, in my lecture in the beginning, I showed a little bit of an advance uh, through initiatives like Solidarity Cities, you know, that uh, there's a bit more of a place now uh, in the EU for cities, but there's not one thing where we can really put our finger on, okay, Eurocities has managed to uh, make sure that money from this fund actually arrives in cities. They have not managed, um, let's say, privileged space in, in, in policy making at EU level yet. No, they, they, they have a voice, they are heard, but they don't have a say yet in, in a systematic way. But what, what are your experiences in that regard? Uh, just very briefly, um, I would say a few concrete examples of going into the pragmatic <laughs> kind of uh, examples. Um, what I've seen is that nowadays there is this, okay, we pass this idea that cities may rule the world, okay, from the mayors. <laughs> And to a more pragmatic idea saying, okay, I think cities should influence, have a more influence at, at, at the other levels, okay, at the national, state, global, European, international level. So that there is this multi-level need of, of, of having influence, you know. Um, somehow, um, for example, what, what I see is that some networks of cities, um, the first one of the impact they have is to evidence 
the others that they don't work. Okay, for example, the Federation, the Spanish Federation of Cities, mm -hmm. and you know, um, they should be dealing with diversity issues. You know, and there are hundreds of cities there, but for whatever the reason, maybe the I mean, maybe there's a working group or whatever, they don't have the, the commitment, there is no the, the strong commitment around. So when another actor appears dealing with these topics and maybe create some, you know, uh, uh, city say, okay, yes, uh, we want to be there. And, 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 and you ask, for example, to talk with the national level government and say, hey, here there are different cities with different colors, political colors. So some of them are the same than the government, but many others not are your position. But we agree on many issues that we are the same. We see the refugees crisis and also some basic response to the refugees things very similar. You know that's something important. And and, and for example, um, how on the just very brief example of the anti rumors. When you start in your city with the anti rumors, and suddenly goes to the Basque country, and the Basque country goes to the uh, Diputación, you know, more regional government, take this and then. The, 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 the regional government, the Basque government, says, wow, this is something interesting. Um, and, and, and the cities ask for some support, and they decide, why don't we provide the common criteria for the whole Basque country, and we set up a network of not just cities, but in which the, national, the regional government is there, and then not only just 10 cities, but also University of the Basque country and 10 big social organizations. That's a very different network suddenly, you know, it's like, it's like a specific topic, but it's been the influence of the city, it's the bottom up, that, that has made the go regional government aware of that. And they say, okay, there are more cities that want to do this, they don't have the budget, they don't have the facilities, they don't have the training, or I can provide some support here. And, and, and then, for example, at the intercultural cities, at, at the Council of Europe, uh, one of the examples that, that it was important in terms of to reach more influence is well, when, when the, the, the ministers in the Council of Europe approved a kind of declaration of saying the intercultural integration model was a really good example to be spread around countries in, in Europe. You know, but that was a formal declaration that then in Spain, in Italy, in Portugal, in, in other countries, you could use it and, and go into your national government and say, listen, it's not us. Only, you know, it's a Council of Europe, it's, it's a 47 ministers from countries very diverse, not just European, well, just yes, European, but it's even Russia is there, you know, so, so, so it's like biggest than the EU idea for many people. So, and they are saying that the intercultural integration model it foster positive interactions, well, we are the network here, so we need to talk, you know. So, this is very small, but I think this idea of moving, looking up, and saying, hey, European Parliament, hey, big organizations, a hey, big thing. The responsibility of cities is not just, uh, they work nowadays in this complex and global world that doesn't finish in their city. You know, they have the responsibility to really to think globally and to act also globally. And sometimes it's making allies with some big cities, sometimes it's, it's doing lobby with the national and European. But I think lately we've seen some examples of, of how mayors have took the lead on some big issues and say, hey guys, you know, stop, you know, I think uh, we, we say that this is, the, the, the citizens we represent, we are for this discourse and these practices and not this European decision that you're having not getting refugees in our countries, you know. So, so, so putting tension and pressure and big demonstrations and, and, and saying things that before it wasn't heard, it's also an, an, an attitude. I think um, this shift, um, so this increasing role of cities, uh, we should not um, discuss it only in the context of migration and diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, from a policy scientific point of view, and there uh, Barber with if mayors rule the world, it was a little bit, uh, well, uh, well uh, huge frame that he used. Uh, but this is the shift in balance of power that we do see. Uh, so uh, we, we constantly say it to our students that come in in the first year, uh, normally they all want to go to the UN and to, uh, to Brussels and we have this nice international uh, and then we have really have to open their eyes and say oh no this is not really the big trend that it may be it may have been the trend in the 80s and the 90s eh? more Europe more globalization in terms of governance but the thing that we see now I wouldn't say we, we, we are returning to no, city no. states but we uh, it is a general trend across policy sectors 
Um, uh, think about environmental policies, for instance, also area is very clear. Mm -hmm. Social policies were mentioned. Eh? One of the reasons of the demise of welfare states is not that we get a European welfare state, now it's being localized, eh? it's mm -hmm. being brought back to the local level where there's much more space for tailor-made measures that fit the specific circumstances and situation of a city. So we are talking today about something that is a much broader shift. Uh, and it's not only the cities that are asking for it, it's the transformation of our society that is leading cities to play a bigger role. Also because what you said in the beginning, more and more people live in the cities mm -hmm. and we live in an era of mm -hmm. urbanization. Secondly, um, I do see in many cases, I do see quite a few positive cases where <laughs> those cities have become entrepreneurs. Eh? So they uh, have become at, at focusy, um, uh, but they, they entered at focusy roles towards um, at the European Union, towards the national level, towards the Council of Europe indeed. Um, but I would not say that they do that with one voice. Eh? Cities are, are just like nation states uh, used uh, to be. They come with very many, uh, many, many different uh, uh, opinions and very uh, different ideas. And some like having refugees and some don't. And both of them try to make their case at higher levels and say, okay, you have to stop this and make the EU-Turkey deal. Or the others say, no, we, we welcome them because that's in our, our tradition. Eh? So I would not want to make a more monolithic idea of what these cities are, are doing. Eh? In, in, uh, in your network, I also know that there is a differentiation eh, between these different types of cities, and that's that's what I what I what I, what I see. And sometimes they come up with a common position, and sometimes they don't. Uh, that's, uh, and the final thing is that uh, sometimes this relation also works the other way around. So not that the cities take uh, their positions to higher levels or higher. And we train our students nowadays not to talk about uh, higher and lower, lower levels of government. There are different levels of government or different governments, but there is no uh, way of saying that a national level is higher than uh, that goes a little bit further. But um, in the other direction, you see also that EU is actually has been surprisingly clever and intelligent in sometimes using cities for their purpose. So the EU has, has been framing its own a substantive policy agenda. You know from this morning what I think of an EU agenda on migrant integration. I'm not so fond of it, uh, to be honest. But they have been very intelligent in saying, okay, this is our agenda. We have no competency in that area. So uh, what do we do? We bypass nation states, we work together with cities, and we bring together those cities that kind of fit, um, fits our uh, idea of how we want to govern migration and diversity. And that is in which they have been very successful eh, in propagating their policy ideas also in that way, to selective support to cities, to city networks, to get a more European frame of migration and diversity. So it goes, the relationship goes really in both ways, eh, between cities and higher levels, uh, other levels of government. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, there's been a shift, and uh, it goes back to what I was saying before about governance, which is the key issue. I mean, for many, many years up to now, local governments and cities were seen only as a service providers. They were not considered political actors. Mm. It was like they have to deliver services, mainly social services, but, and that's it. The municipal movement was set at international level and the state level set, and mainly in, in the European Union has played quite an important role, is that we local governments, we are not only providers of services, we do that, but we are political actors. And that changed the dynamics, because it's not only if you are a pro uh, service provider, you have this hierarchical you know, structure of things that you have. Uh, state, le state level government, regional level, and local, lo uh, local governments, and that goes in one direction. When you, see, you say, I'm a political actor in myself, and I deliver policies, I don't only deliver services, but I deliver policies, that has a shift. Because then, when someone at that upper level is deciding policies that will have an impact on what you are doing. You have the right to say, and I think the most clear example is as well this kind of alliances, like the European Union, I was thinking about the, the covenant of mayors. You know, the covenant of mayors is on the energy efficiency. The European Union saw that they couldn't reach certain agreements at national level, so they overpassed the national governments and they were working with local cities. And that started with only a few cities, and now it's all spread. It has such an impact that now we have a global covenant of mayors globally throughout the world. And I think that the movement with what has happened at the environmental level, 
could happen as well that in other policy areas like social areas. For example, in the in, in United States, last week there was the COP23. The COP23 is the follow-up of the Paris Agreements on Environment. It took place in Vaughan, and there was the governor of, of California saying, well, Trump can say that they are stepping out, the United States is stepping out from the Paris Agreements on Environment, but now already 32 governors of the United States and 3,000 mayors will deliver on the Paris Agreements. So that's an example that now you acknowledge yourself as an actor and you acknowledge yourself that you can influence and you have certain priorities in your territory that regardless that your nation state decides something, you can push the agenda. And in fact, now we're working at, at the global level. I think that's why it's not only on social issues, it's more a global, global thing and it's all, all these interconnections. For example, we are working as well what we call a program with all the networks of local governments, we call it a seat at the global table. And it's about, if you're going to decide things that will have an impact on us, at least we want to be not only heard, but also we want to take part in shaping things. And there's a shift already because so far, even now we're dealing with, dealing with us with the United Nations, with the European Union, I think we have overcome. Some years ago, civil society organizations and local governments were the same. Local governments were considered civil society organizations, like an NGO. Now the European Union is, has quite distinguished that, and even when you are dialoguing and, and having debates with them. With the, the United Nations, still the same. We are put in the same bag as civil society organizations and NGOs. And we say, no, we are not NGOs, we are government. And that change produces you when they understand that you are government and you are not an NGO. The shift of relationship changes. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. I think these are perfect. Uh, Final words for this panel. Thanks a lot for your very inspiring, uh, I find, interventions. And with that, I close this panel and hand over to Juan Carlos to, uh, to whatever, to give us further <laughs> instructions. <laughs>